uh, nodding off. Um, yeah, nodding off. That's with right. Mark and Connor. <laughs> nodding off with Mark and Connor. <laughs> sounds good. Uh, it sounds very gentle and comforting. Yeah. Well, and it gives you permission to go to sleep if it gets too boring. (laughs) (laughs) Hello, you're watching Nodding Off with Mark and Connor. This is a, wait, what do we call this? Let's just call it a show. Okay. The show. Hello, you're watching Nodding Off with Mark and Connor. This is a show that explores a new product that's coming out, the Nod, the Noetic Oracular Deck. Uh, Today we're going to be talking about the birth of the concept of the Noosphere, uh, which leads to this new technology. I hope you enjoy it. So, you want to just dig into it? To the history of the concept. Yeah, so let's, let's start talking about the noosphere, what that concept has, has historically kind of meant, um, philosophically or spiritually, and uh, then maybe we can talk a little bit about where it's going. Sure. So it's, it's real interesting because originally it is not at all a philosophical or spiritual concept. Uh, it, it starts, I believe, in the 20s um, with a Soviet archaeologist named Vladimir Vernadsky. What he's talking about is he, he, he divides archaeology up into these spheres, uh, the lithosphere, when archaeology is just rocks. Uh, and then when life emerges, you start getting a biosphere, which is where life is creating fossils, you know, bones, the little diatomes, troglodytes, all that kind of stuff, or tri- trilobites, Trilobites. Yeah. I mean, maybe some troglodytes too. <laughs> Later on. <laughs> I gotta Actually, go somewhere. So when, when troglodytes come about, that's when you start getting what Vladimir's concept of the, of the noosphere is, which is um, strata with uh, fossils that have to do with humans changing things. So like once tools get, get built, so then geologically speaking, we're looking at the, the sort of fossil of an idea, the, right. the sort of the physical remnant of an idea that a human had. Right, right. So for Vladimir Vernadsky, the noosphere starts in Kenya when you first start finding uh, f- flint being napped, you know, made into little hand axes would be the first thing. And then the first major event in that would be uh, the, the the first battle that takes place, where you can you can tell that people got tied up and killed. Uh, I forget the name of the lake. It's it's it, but it's this lake in Kenya that that we find this. Um, but so for him, it's this very mundane, set in stone kind of thing. Um, Literally, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, but so dude is, is Soviet. And so those ideas don't really get out of the USSR, except that there's this French Jesuit priest who's a paleontologist who it, it keeps getting almost excommunicated because he's doing all this work with evolution, which the Catholics aren't into but because he's a Jesuit and for some reason the Pope can't touch the Jesies, even though the Popes have always been trying to shut him down. Uh, Pierre Tejard de Chardin is able to, to slip by. So he's in France listening to these uh, shortwave radio broadcasts where Vladimir Vernadsky is talking about this new idea the noosphere, uh, which should we go over the etymology of that word for a second, I guess? Yeah, let's talk about that. Okay, so so for Vernadsky, you have lithosphere, which litho is rock, Stone. just rocks. Biosphere, when you start finding evidence of life, bio, and these are Greek words, uh, bio is, is life. So noosphere would be from nos, which is mind, where thought is actually affecting the geological record. Right. 
Um, now this becomes important for Tehard de Shardim because it, it, it's, it's not just the effect that it's having on the biological record for him. He is looking for a way to, to reconcile his spirituality, his religion, with what he's finding in the geological record. So the actual thought becomes what the noosphere is for him. And he's able to justify evolution through this uh, in saying, oh, this is a process of an intensification of information. And he views this process as, as creation. Um, and he sees information becoming more and more intensified uh, until it reaches what he calls the omega point, which is where all, inf all information can be contained at once in this one thing, a, a pure understanding. E everything symbolizes everything. And for Teo de Shadin, that's the second coming. And it sounds a little bit like a singularity, right? <laughs> that's exactly what it is. He yeah. calls it the singularity. This is, as far as I know, the first concept of a singularity, uh, which now, of course, that's a purely technological thing. Right. Yeah, we, we only think of that as the, this point at which what, uh, all artificial intelligence mm -hmm. outstrips the, uh, our, our ability to keep up with it. We're going to bring in the word transhumanism now. Like, this is the birth of transhumanism. Teo de Chardin is the first person to print the word transhumanism, which is now completely a technological thing about building ourselves into the machine, downloading our consciousness onto the internet, leaving humanity, our humanity part behind. It, it's a very spiritual and extremely human thing in the beginning for these philosophers. And it has right. nothing to do with tech. I mean, well, not nothing to do with technology, but technology aids us in being human and achieving this human transcendence. This is called a transcendent transhumanism rather than uh, technological transhumanism. And the, tech, and the singularity is a, a transcendent singularity rather than the technological. technological singularity that we think of now. Rather than being this terrifying thing that's coming to eat us, it is our salvation and our entrance into what this priest would say is heaven. I mean, I guess he's sort of the first one who's starting to bring in a spiritual element to this previously geological or, or you know, ar archeological paleonto paleontological uh, idea. And so for him, does that kind of pair with a, a decoupling of, of the human from the, the physical being, or does it kind of take into account this no sphere, like this, this realm of ideas as intrinsic to human physicality? It's intrinsic to human physicality. So for Catholics, uh, like the mind and the body aren't separate, or, or the spirit and the body aren't separate. They're two things, and you have to, like biological development is a part of uh, spiritual development. And I mean, you see that in a lot of, the, uh, this is a very, uh, it's very popular in Kung Fu films, you know? Right. You know, the, the body is the temple. I, I work on, it, it's a very Zen thing. Zen archery is a lot about this, you know, that I concentrate so fully on the details of what my body is doing and that clears my mind. And that is where the spiritual development takes place. Right. So there's an essential dualism to it with, with a heavy emphasis on embodiment. Totally, totally. Yeah. In the beginning, up until the Renaissance kind of science and religion, particularly Catholicism, are the same thing. Like all of the, the natural philosophers, Newton and whatnot, they're, they're studying science because that's how you know the mind of God. Yeah. Uh, and then things get hinky, particularly when once the Protestant Reformation starts, and, and that's when you start getting bad science, science that's uh, kind of going against what the church is saying. That gets you burnt at the stake. But it comes out of, I mean, all the scientists are monks because they're the ones that think they're, they are the professional thinking people. Yeah, that's, uh, that's academia <laughs> in, that right, right. In, West, in Western culture. So Teilhard de Chardin's concept is kind of bringing science back to 
religion. You know, he's, he's remarrying those two things for him, which is something that I feel like the Jesuits either get praised for or denounced. I mean, in, um, you can see this a lot in Mason Dixon uh, by the, Thomas. The Mason. Yeah. Yeah. Jesuits play a big part in that. They, they, um, they're very involved in that whole thing. They're a shadowy secret society that have been building these secret arcane devices that are clocks. So yeah, they, the Jesuits in that are super scientist, bad guys, science villains, like, uh, uh, like Captain Nemo in the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. Interesting. I didn't, yeah. I didn't know. Uh, I mean, it's, it sounds very Pynchon esque. Like, I mean, Pynchon's going to make Pynchon things happen in, yeah. in a novel, but that, that's, that's interesting kind of, to do it with the Jesuits. That, that's kind of why it's incredible that we have a Jesuit Pope now because Popes don't like the, this is the first Jesuit Pope and Popes have been trying to shut the Jesuits down and the Jesuits keep surviving anyhow and he's a contentious pope yeah and and a, a very progressive pope uh, yeah i mean in, re- relatively speaking <laughs> for a pope. i mean yeah in in the the span of pope especially given that the last pope was a nazi a hitler youth you know <laughs> although when i back when i was hanging out with the the catholics a couple, a couple of years ago uh which were really right wing Catholics. Uh, they had all sorts of weird things to say about Ratzinger, how like he's the one who he, he was one of the people that were really behind Vatican II, which was the whole thing that happened, I believe, in the 60s that really opened up the church, made the, the mass to be said in, in English rather than, or in your native language. Vernacular, yeah. Just in Latin. Uh, turned the priest around so he's facing the congregation. Uh, it brings in the handshake of peace, which is something that had been ditched long ago. It was, it was originally the kiss of peace. And then Catholics were like, no, touching. Let's not. And then in the 60s, we brought it back to like, well, we can shake hands and just say, hey, we're chill in the middle of the mass. And actually, there's a book by a guy named Theodore Sturgeon that I, is an amazing book called God's Body this priest is driving into town and he sees a naked man on the side of the road. He's like, I got to help this naked man, but this naked man's so beautiful. And he, he, he helps him along and gives him clothes. And then he goes home to his wife. It's not a Catholic priest, this character. He goes home to his wife and it's just like, I saw this beautiful man and now we must have sex. And this guy just goes through town inspiring everyone to have sex. And by the end of it, you realize like, Oh, this guy's God. But it's this whole discussion of the idea of agape that uh, is this love God, of us. Yeah, a boundless right. love. Yeah. But it's an argument that, that the mass starts out as an orgy. <laughs> that there's an agape orgy. And, and uh, this is also explored in Dune, the Tao Siege orgy, where the whole community all has sex together and experience a, a bleeding, the, all their minds become one. And, and that is, in the Bible, what, what God is supposed to be, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in their midst. Uh, Here you go. The, you know, the church is the body of Christ. Like, together, we are God. And, and it makes sense that bodies would be a really important aspect of that. Mm-hmm. This is actually a concept that, I use a lot in my idea of the noosphere. This, this is mimetic life. These gestalt, what I was calling demomorphic edelons. You know, the United States would be an example of this, as would say the Boy Scouts or the or Wolf Pack. Yeah, or the Wolf Pack. <laughs> yeah. These are all their own entities that we participate in. Definitely. That, I mean, and then I think those entities end up having their own high priests. That totally. It's something we've talked a lot about in Wolfpack. I think that one of the reasons why it's important to think about this kind of stuff is those entities, just because they are born from our minds, they're not on our side necessarily. And I think when you look at the politics that are going on right now, you can see the gods are real and they're trying to eat us. 
Both of our political parties are not trying to help the individual humans that make them up. We are being eaten up by them. Yeah, and I and I think that's going to be a really interesting thing for us to cover in our next episode. This has been Nodding Off with Mark and Connor. Thanks for watching. Uh, if you'd like to check out our channel for more content, you can watch our book club, Wolfpack, uh, every other Sunday. We stream live, but you can also watch our old episodes, as well as a lot of other older content back from when it was possible to see people in the flesh and put on plays. So uh, we invite you to like and subscribe and uh, stay tuned for more content and more information about the Noetic Oracular deck.